We continue uh, with the talk by Hergo on uh, counting hypergraph colorings in the local uh, lamellar regime. Thank you, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me. It's really nice to be back in science. Uh, so actually, before the talk, let me uh, advertise a recent result of mine, and which is actually quite related to the last talk. So we gave some kind of a, a optimal mixing time bound for these uh, Lorentzian distributions, uh, improving upon a uh, breakthrough result of an array at all. Um, but yeah, th but this is a, a randomized counting, so I will not talk about this today. I will instead talk about counting hypergraph colorings, and I have a, sort of two motivations to talk about this. First is that the method, the algorithm, is one that hasn't been uh, covered in this workshop yet. So this is a basically Moitra's method, and uh, it's deterministic counting, and we actually don't understand it that well. We don't know how to relate this to existing methods like correlation decay or like zeros. Um, the second um, motivation of mine is that the problem itself, I think, is very interesting, and uh, we can prove something from non-trivial. Uh, it's not very satisfying, and I hope to stimulate some interest in studying the problem, and maybe we can see an answer one day. Okay, so yeah, so this is joint work with uh, uh, Liao Chao and uh, Zhang Chihao from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and also uh, Lu Pian from Shanghai University of uh, uh, Finance and Economics, uh, who is in the audience. Okay. Let's start with uh, color range. Okay, we, I believe most uh, you know this. Uh, so this is a pictorial definition of colorings, and whenever I say coloring, I mean proper coloring. So I want uh, uh, different colors uh, for every adjacent pair of vertices. Okay. And uh, I will also talk about some kind of computational complexity phase transition. I think this is very well known in, for the audience, so I will not spend too much time on this. Um, and uh, by computational complexity phase transition, what I mean is when the, some parameters change, the, prob the complexity of the problem also change drastically. So, so the toy example is that um, the problem of uh, um, deciding whether the graph is uh, Q colorable or find the coloring if it exists. So of, apparently this is trivial. If Q is one, two, you have two colors, then it's just test whether it's peptide or not. But when Q is at least three, the problem suddenly jumps to NB hard. So this is also interesting, and the slightly more interesting case is when you have a degree bond. Okay, so let's say I'm talking about graphs with maximum degree delta, and uh, of course, when the uh, number of colors Q is uh, sufficiently large, then it's easy to solve the problem. You just do a gradient algorithm, right? Uh, and uh, you can actually go slightly below delta plus one to roughly delta minus square root delta. Uh, it can still be solved in polynomial <coughs> time due to a result by Malloy and Reed. And if you go to sort of one below this square hole, the problem jumps to NP hard uh, due to an early result by Abdom Winner. Uh, Hogarty and Kruger, also I probably pronounced it terribly wrong. Um, so yeah, this, this sort of decision version of coloring is very well understood, uh, even in the uh, bounded degree case. Uh, but of course, our program is about uh, counting, and uh, I will talk about approximate counting mostly. Um, <clears throat> so approximate counting and sort of a uniform sampling are, are closely related, and especially in these regimes. Um, because of self-reducibility, they are actually the same problem. So can, can we generate a uniform proper coloring uh, so efficiently? Um, again, these are, there are some early successes due to the Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, approach uh, by uh, Jerome and uh, independently Silas and Soko. Uh, they show that the global dynamics is rapid mixing when Q is at least two delta. So global dynamics is the one where you, at every step you randomly pick a vertex and you recolor it. And uh, this was improved by Vigoda to uh, <coughs> roughly 11 over 6 delta. Um, he showed a uh, uh, more complicated dynamics called uh, Wang Swanson Koteski uh, dynamics is rapid mixing. And uh, this stood as the best result for like almost 20 years until very recently uh, we got the improvement. Uh, due to two groups of people independently, uh, Chen and Moitra, and also they're called Perano and uh, Posso. Uh, so they improved this to 11 over 6 minus a very small epsilon. The epsilon is something like 10 to the minus 4. So 
but the, the conceptual message is that this is not a barrier. And uh, on the other hand, we have NB hardness if Q is less than delta. Uh, this is due to uh, Galanis, Stefankovich, and uh, uh, Bigoda. Uh, but for some technical reasons, this only works for even Q. Uh, but you don't really <laughs> expect all the Q to be different. Okay. So the question really is where is the threshold? What is the truth? So the conjecture is that the threshold is uh, delta plus one. And this is actually a threshold of uh, uniqueness of Gibbs measures in an infinite delta regular tree. So basically, the conjecture is that um, whenever it behaves nicely on infinite regular tree, it should, uh, um, we should have algorithm on, um, on any uh, delta bounded degree graph. Okay. And really, what happens here is that uh, when Q is uh, delta plus one, this example is uh, uh, we have degree three and uh, four colors, then you can have this sort of a frozen configuration, frozen colorings. So basically, if you want to do global dynamics, you want to remove the color of one vertex and recolor it, there's only one possible choice. So if you do global dynamics, uh, this configuration will just uh, freeze. It cannot go anywhere. Um, so this is sort of a problem uh, when the sort of Markov chain approach will stop to work and it's conjectured to be the threshold. Um, but as we all know, the Markov chain is not the only method. Right? We have these, all these deterministic counting algorithms as well. Um, so we can do this so-called correlation decay method. This was first um, developed by uh, Gamanik Katz for this problem that uh, if Q is larger than or equal to some alpha times delta plus beta, where beta is large and alpha is roughly 2.8, 2.84, then you can do deterministic counting based on the correlation decay method. So basically, you do some kind of recursive algorithm and uh, truncate. And this was improved by uh, Lu and In uh, to alpha roughly 2.58. On the other hand, we can also do these uh, uh, sort of zeros of polynomial method, or the method of many names. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So this method at first. Uh, uh, but not method is uh, quasi polynomial time, but uh, Patel Rex made it to so really polynomial time. And uh, so, a direct consequence of this result is that you can do it for Q larger than alpha times delta. Alpha is something like 6.91. Six uh, 6 this comes from an earlier paper from Jackson uh, Prox Proxy uh, Soko, I think. Um, yeah, and this was recently improved to Q larger than so E times delta due to a bunch Davis, uh, Patel, and Rex. Um, but I guess it's fair to say that we cannot match the uh, randomized algorithm, at least not yet. Okay, so that's pretty much what we know about uh, determinist, uh, about counting color rings. So we have some hardness, we have some result, uh, algorithm result, but they are not quite the same yet, but uh, it's in the, on the same order. Right? It's just that we can't have the best constant yet. Okay, so what I'm really going to talk about is hypergraph colorings. So I move on to hypergraphs. And the, the coloring I'm working with is sort of a weak uh, coloring where I only want to forbid monochromatic edges. Okay, so this is a, again pictorial proof. No edge is monochromatic. These, uh, these boxes are my hyper edges. And so what about hyper, uh, <coughs> sorry, hypergraph colorings? It also got started. And uh, you can do Markov chain, you can do path coupling, et cetera. So uh, Baldwish, Dyer, and Karpinski, um, like more than 10 years ago, they showed that the global dynamics is, again, rapid mixing. If, uh, say, I have a, a k-uniform hypergraph, if k is larger than equal to 4 and q larger than delta, or k equals 3, uh, q larger than 1.5 delta. Right? So this seems a lot better than counting colorings in graphs because well, I mean, we spend so much time to improve the constant, and here you sort of get constant one for most cases. However, although it looks like better, but it's actually much worse. Um, because we know that if you apply Lovash local lemma, which I will talk about in more details later, um, if you apply Lovash local lemma, then the existence of plot coloring uh, will be guaranteed um, as long as uh, Q is at least something roughly delta to the one over k minus one. So it's actually, even if q is much less than delta, there still, there still is a proper coloring. And uh, so this delta cannot be the right answer. 
Um, and uh, indeed, this was also <coughs> so further uh, pushed by Fries and uh, um, his collaborators. So Fries and Melstad, they um, gave an example when, so when Q is uh, uh, much less than delta, then there exists a sort of frozen coloring where no move is possible. Um, <coughs> And uh, indeed, their, their result is uh, mainly an algorithmic result, uh, but this is sort of a, just a consequence, sorry, a, a side note that there do exist frozen colorings for Markov chain approach. Um, and uh, um, nonetheless, the result of phrase and mouse is algorithmic and it got improved later uh, by phrase and uh, Anastos. They show that global dynamics, it still converges um, rapidly, although there are frozen uh, configurations, but they, they have some very strong con uh, conditions. So the, the bound on Q, so the second term here, is roughly matches, roughly matches the delta to the one over K minus one. So that's very good. But they assume the hypergraph is simple, so which means every two hyperides intersect in at most one vertex. So this is a very strong um, restriction. And also they require the uh, number of colors to be at least log n. So it cannot be constant colors. So although the Markov chain approach still can work, but it has some drawbacks. Um, so our result, on the other hand, we don't get the best constant. We get some terrible constant here. So it's like delta to the 14 over k minus 14. And also we need k to be really large. Um, oh, and a huge constant here. But the point is we don't have any further uh, assumptions. This is our only assumption, and this is a constant. So this is by no means the, um, the correct answer, but uh, we can't optimize. We'll try to optimize this, but this is basically what we got. Um, we don't know how to optimize it further. Um, so we get a, a polynomial time approximation uh, scheme, uh, which is deterministic algorithm to count the number of Q colorings, K uniform hypergraph, maximum degree delta. Um, and uh, somewhat interestingly, in these regimes, you cannot do self-reducibility. Um, well, the reason in coloring, in normal coloring, the condition we have is something like Q over delta is larger than equal to some alpha. And uh, when we do self-reducibility, we ping vertices one by one, right? Say, if a neighbor of a vertex got pinged, you can effectively remove one color from that vertex, you get some kind of least coloring. So this would imply that Q minus one over delta minus one will still be larger than equal to half. Okay, so, so the, these properties are sort of uh, preserved on the self-reductions. Uh, but here, because Q is much less than delta, you actually cannot afford to do this. So somehow the self-reducibility self doesn't hold anymore. So we need to spend some extra time to get a uh, almost uniform sampler. Um, and also we need to have somewhat uh, worse um, constants. Okay. And as I said earlier, the method that we use is completely different from correlation decay and the um, you know, uh, by mean octa method. Um, and it's uh, sort of a more refined version of a, a, result, uh, a method of Moitra, and it's closely related to Lovash low climb. And uh, basically, our original motivation is to understand Moitra's method. We try to understand what is essential and what is sort of unnecessary. And indeed, we sort of get rid of one auxiliary process of Moitra. And uh, if you have the in the original approach, you, because he had this auxiliary thing, uh, he would have a extra condition, but we sort of got rid of this. And this condition only involves K and delta, not Q. But we don't need this. Okay, so that's the uh, result. Um, any questions so far? Have you tried any of these other approaches? Um, I, I, ha I haven't tried the zeros. Um, but uh, I tried a little bit of writing the recursion for sort of correlation decay, and it turns out to be quite complicated. You don't get a clean, as clean recursion as the graph case. So I don't know how to make other things work. Okay. All right, so I will move on to tell you about what this algorithm is about, how it relates to Lovash low climber. Um, so, okay, this is a warm up, sort of a, um, 
what's, what is the local lemma? We have seen local lemma in, uh, on Monday uh, due to its connection to independence polynomials uh, in Imona and uh, 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 Ryan's talk. Um, <coughs> but let me remind you what the local lemma is. Um, so the, in fact, the very original local lemma was used to show the existence of uh, three colorings in hypergraphs. So this is sort of the tool designed to tackle this problem. And uh, in general, we have uh, some hypergraph, and uh, we will let the neighborhood of a hyper edge to be all the edges that sort of intersecting this edge. And uh, that's the, because of degree bound, uh, we have the size of neighborhood is at most something like delta minus one times k. And uh, I will be particularly uh, interested in this so-called asymmetric form of the local lemma due to Lavash. That, so we give some numbers to every hyper edge, and uh, the condition we want is the probability of, under product distribution, the probability of uh, the hyper edge is monochromatic, is at most these numbers, times uh, one minus of these numbers uh, in the neighborhood. If this holds for every hyper edge, then the proper coloring exists. Okay. And uh, normally we set these numbers to something like one over k times delta, and it's relatively easy to work out that this quantity on the right hand side is lower bounded by one over e times k times delta, and uh, the left hand side, because uh, <coughs> it's product distribution, is just uh, you have a cool possibility of monochromatic uh, configurations, and the total probability, total possibility is q to the k. To get one over q to k minus, so this recovers the condition I mentioned earlier. Q is at least e k delta to the one over k minus one. So as long as this holds, then we have a uh, proper color. Okay. So the first thing, first useful thing of this is that we can use it to um, reduce compute uh, sort of counting to computing marginal probabilities. Um, as I said earlier, the self-reducibility doesn't really work anymore, um, but we can use the uh, local lemma to find sort of a good uh, uh, partial coloring, and we try to compute the marginal probability of this good partial coloring. So this is uh, what I denote by tau, and uh, what we want is that every hyper edge is satisfied by its first uh, some k1 vertices. Uh, I give an arbitrary ordering of the vertices. So this will succeed, it's a very easy application of a uh, local lemma that this will succeed as long as Q is larger than, basically I replace K by this K1, and the K1 eventually will be set, some, set to be something like K over 14. So we pin this, um, we pin some small fraction of the vertices in each hyper edge, and then we try to compute the marginal probability of this partial coloring. So let's say this is our vertices that I pinned, and the mu is a uniform distribution. So the probability that a random coloring is consistent with this tau is just q to the n minus r, r being the size of the partial coloring, divided by all the number of colorings. And uh, you can uh, sort of easily rewrite this as a telescoping product, and uh, our <coughs> algorithm will just estimate these marginal probabilities one by one. So effectively, we want uh, estimate marginal probabilities under some partial colorings that will use some of the verses but not all of the verses. Okay. Yeah, this is just what I said. I want to estimate all these marginal probabilities um, up to something like one over epsilon over n error because I will modify roughly n things here. Okay. So that's a nice application that you can reduce uh, counting to uh, computing marginal probabilities um, Although self-reducibility doesn't quite work anymore. Okay. okay. Um, another nice thing about local lemma is that you can actually prove something about the dis uniform distribution using the local lemma. And uh, again, this C is a set of all colorings, and the mu is a uniform distribution. Effectively, you can think of mu as a product distribution, conditioned on there's no monochromatic edges. And the, the local lemma actually controls this uh, conditional distribution in that if the condition holds, asymmetric condition holds, then for any event, um, the probability of this event uh, in the conditional distribution is at most the product distribution multiplied by some correction terms. And this correction term is uh, something like one over one minus x of e, where e 
so this event B will depend on some set of verses, and uh, uh, the event uh, these hyperedges E are just uh, those intersecting this set of verses. And this is a um, theorem due to Hopler, Saha, and Srinivasan. Um, so basically, we can give upper bounds on the on any event uh, in this uh, um, conditional distribution. Of course, we can't give lower bound because we want to limit some of the bad events, right? Okay, so we have these upper bounds. What's this useful to us? Um, in fact, using this, we, it's <coughs> rather easy to see that under any partial coloring, the vertices, each marginal probability for any vertex uh, is actually very close to uniform. Okay, so I have some assumptions. Say this edge size is something between k and k prime because we, are, we will be operating under partial colorings. So we need some. So the size of the hyper edges will decrease, but not too much. And I have some parameter t, which we'll pick later. Again, I have this sort of condition. Um, it's a local lemma type condition. Then I can show that the marginal probability is, <coughs> is roughly 1 over q, but with some uh, error, uh, like uh, some constant over t, where t is something I can choose. So, to prove this is very easy. You prove upper bound is just a, a direct application of the lemma I showed you last slide. And uh, to give a lower bound, you just uh, give upper bound for sort of blocking cases. Blocking cases are where you have uh, all the verses having this color C, um, and then you use a union bound on all these uh, hyper okay. So basically, this controlled version of the local lemma gives us uh, local uniformity. And uh, we'll, eventually, we will set this t to be something like delta to the c. Um, and uh, our condition is something like this. So if you plug in delta to the c, it will give you something like this. Um, so what, had, what do I have? Well, I have that under the uniform distribution, all verses are very close to uniform. But this is really nonsense, right? Because they are really just uniform. All colors are symmetric. What's really useful of this is that when I have some partial colorings, some of the verses are already colored, but at least I have k prime many sort of still available. Then I can control the uniformity locally for each marginal probability. So the k prime is something like k minus k1. Okay. And um, so this is very nice. It tells us something about the um, marginal probability, um, but it's not good enough, right? Our goal is something like 1 plus minus epsilon over n approximation. This gives us some constant approximation. So it's not good enough. The real magic is so that we can um, bootstrap this into a very good approximation. OK, so that um, I will need to define a sort of a coupling process. Um, the algorithm itself is completely deterministic. It's essentially a uh, linear programming algorithm. Um, but somehow the margin, uh, the variables from the, uh, in the linear program comes from this coupling process. Although we don't really run this coupling process. We don't know how to run it. Okay. So let's say I want to compute the marginal probability of some vertex V. And uh, C sub i will be the set of colorings where V is given color i. And mu i is uniform over C sub i. So what we want to do is that we want to couple mu1 and mu2. So at vertex v, we have discrepancy. And we want to, in some, some way, couple verses one by one so that we get to some boundary that are um, sort of uh, nice. Uh, all the constraints are satisfied. Kind of. um, so the process is something like this. So I start with uh, the v1 will always be discrepancies. So at first, I have one vertex. I will maintain some set of colored verses, and the rest of <coughs> v2 is the rest of the verses v minus v1. And for each hyper edge, sort of still intersecting between v1 and v2, uh, I will try to couple the first vertex of that. And uh, I will couple it maximally, assuming the marginal probability is unknown. Of course, I don't know that, and I cannot run the coupling. But let's assume we can do that. Then I know that because of local uniformity, I know the marginal probabilities are close to uniform. So whatever we, uh, uh, C1 or C2, we can couple it uh, with very low error. And uh, whenever a hyper edge is satisfied in both copies, I will remove it. And uh, whenever a hyper edge 
too many color, you know, hyperedge, too many vertices are colored, then I will put all of the rest as if I filled the whole edge. Although these vertices are not colored yet, but I will think of them as filled, I put them in V1. And I, again, we remove the edge. And when all the hyperedge intersecting V1 are removed, I will stop. So, oh, and this constant K2 will eventually be set to something like 3K over 7. Um, yeah, so this seems quite abstract, and I have an example. Okay, so this is my hypergraph, and uh, I start with some vertex V. Uh, at first, I have two different colors, uh, blue and, uh, sorry, green and uh, red. And then the, we, ha we have this hyper edge, and I will uh, color the first vertex. Okay, maybe I'm not lucky. I got red here and blue here. Although this hyper edge is satisfied, this one is not. So I will not uh, remove the hyper edge. And also, I, let's say I want to only color two verses out of uh, the four. So I will put the rest of them as if they, are fi they were filled. Um, although I haven't tried to couple them at all. Okay? So all of them will be in V1 because I have met my uh, threshold. And then I will continue to do this. Okay, now I have looking at this hyper edge. Maybe I'm lucky. Oh, I, I'm not lucky in that I, I don't get the same color, but I'm lucky both copies, the hyper edge is satisfied. And I will remove it. And then I will look at this hyper edge. I'm, now I'm lucky I, I got the same color. And if, <coughs> sorry, uh, this hyper edge. This hyper edge uh, got satisfied in both. And this guy, I have the same color, so V1 doesn't increase anymore. And OK, I remove it. And I will look at this vertex. Again, let's say I'm lucky, I got the same color. However, this hyper edge, although the colors are the same, uh, they are not satisfied. And also, I meet my limit. I have colored two vertices. I will put the rest of them in the field set, in the discrepancies set. So the, although this, is, this remaining vertex is not colored, I still put it in V1. And I still have a hyper edge intersecting V1 and V2, namely these uh, two hyper edges. OK, then I continue. Maybe I'm not very lucky. I got the same color, same color, and they are satisfied, they are removed. Okay, that's how the halving process goes. And basically, because of local uniformity, you can show that as long as you have some empty vertices in these hyper edges, um, and the Q is satisfied by some kind of local lemma type condition, then the coupling will stop in log n steps with a very high probability. Um, well, intuitively, because uh, each vertex, you have a very small um, uh, probability to, be, to have a discrepancy, a discrepant, and the sort of branching factor is something like delta times k, so this, some kind of branching process will stop very quickly. Okay. And uh, so this is basically where things are different from our approach and Moitra. Moitra, Mo, Moitra marks what to couple in advance. So he first runs some, uh, proce some process to mark verses to be uh, coupled and then uh, do the coupling process, whereas our coupling is sort of adaptive. We do this on the fly. Um, but this is our sort of main difference. Okay. All right. So one way to think about this coupling is that it's, it's some kind of a tree, right? You start with uh, uh, some partial colorings at x and y. And it has Q square many children, possibilities, to color the next vertex, which I will denote by U. So basically, uh, you have Q choices for, in each copy, you have Q square many. So this gives us some coupling tree. And uh, the, the really uh, the nice thing is that we can write down some uh, linear program according to this tree. So we cannot run coupling. The coupling requires us to know the marginal probabilities. We don't know that. Instead, we will set up a linear program, something like this. OK, so the definition looks a bit strange. Um, <coughs> this is a mu couple x, y. Basically, the probability you see x, comma, y in, that <coughs> in the coupling process. And the x version of this uh, is multiplied by c1 over cx. This is actually the probability that condition on seeing x, the, in the other copy, you see y. And this is uh, the other way around. Um, yeah, this cx, cy are sort of the number, uh, the set of colorings that are consistent with x or y. Um, 
one first thing to notice is uh, these are really probabilities. Um, if you sum them, you get one. And uh, yeah, when you sum them, it's basically the probability that you get x, you sum over all y. So that is exactly cx over c1. Okay. So the, the next thing we are going to do is that we will write linear programs of these, uh, uh, of these variables. And then we will do some kind of binary search uh, to solve for the real ratio between c1 and c2. So this is what we want to do. So C1 and C2 can be right at this form. It's just from definition. And uh, the nice observation is that whenever coupling um, stops, it's a leaf in the coupling tree, then we can compute this Cx over Cy in time exponential in the uncolored vertices within V1. And uh, we sort of know the coupling process will stop in log n steps um, with high probability. So we, almost always we can afford to do this. Okay, the first constraints are eventually we will set up binary search. So the first constraints are guess sort of lower bound and upper bound for C1 over C2. This is what we want to solve, really. We will, we will uh, do binary search to find. Um, and uh, these are the first constraints. We basically guess a lower bound, guess an upper bound. We write this for all the internal x, y, of uh, all the leave x, y. Um, and uh, the second constraints are sort of important. These are sort of flow kind of constraints. So as I said, the, this you can think of this as condition on seeing x0 was the probability of seeing y. So at the first, in the root, you have only one vertex. You, of course, the probability of seeing the other one is 1. Um, but for every non-leaf vertex, in the coupling tree, it has many children. <coughs> and uh, if you sum over all the possibilities on the y side, you see effectively you see um, y without the u colored. So you get actually the probability of px over uh, the x version of px xy. So these are, <coughs> these are sort of flow constraint. So all of these, all of these children, uh, where you know, y copy get some color, will sum to this guy. Okay. And similarly on the y side. So why is this useful? So we, <coughs> due to this sort of flow kind of constraint, for any given sigma uh, coloring that is where vertex v is colored one, if we sum over all the leaves where x, so, so all the leaves in the coupling tree is just a pair of partial colorings, um, where x is consistent with sigma. If we sum over all of them, it's just a one due to the flow kind of uh, uh, constraint. So now we can rewrite C1 as the sum of ones, and therefore it's sum of these guys. So it's easy to write this is a sum over all the leaves of this Px, Xy <coughs> times the number of uh, colorings consistent with Cx. And therefore we can get the ratio um, <coughs> is exactly this sum. But due to the first constraint, we know that uh, each term of this is between the lower, guessed lower and upper bound. Therefore, the ratio between C1 and C2 must be between the lower and upper bound. So this is sort of the, uh, what's it called, soundness of the program. So the, of course, the ori uh, if the guessed lower and upper bound are correct, then the true values of these PXXYs will satisfy the program. And if the program is satisfied, then the true ratio will be between our upper and the lower bound. So we can set up a binary search to find this ratio. And then when we get the ratio for every pair of colors, we can get the uh, marginal probability. However, this is not the end, because um, as you can imagine, the linear program will have to run the whole coupling. The coupling has a very high probability of terminating log n steps, but it will, uh, but it's not necessary of log n size. So it can be exponentially large. So, but we know it terminates quickly, so we can do truncation. We truncate at some kind of log in uh, steps. Um, so this is where some of this local uniformity comes in. Uh, we will write um, the last kind of constraints. So basically it's saying, in, I'm, I have some x and y. In the next step, I will color u, but u got different colors, c and c prime. But because of the local uniformity I always maintain, um, I know the error is at most something like 5 over t. 
And this quantity t eventually is set to something like delta to the 6. So we have this third kind of constraint. Because of the local uniformity, we will guarantee the truncation will not give us too much error. And also, we know that the true value will satisfy this. Okay, so the truncation error comes from this. So again, in the previous um, scene, we sort of rewrite side of C1 as sum of all the uh, sum of all <coughs> sum of ones of the, the each of these colorings, and each, each one can be written as this form. So when you truncate some those non so, so those leaves that are too deep in the coupling tree will be truncated. It will sort of vanish from this sum. Um, so the truncation error comes from conditioning on this sigma. The coupling will run for too long. So you have too many deep leaves. However, this could happen. For example, if sigma has uh, the first half vertices for every hyper edge to be monochromatic, then none of the edge will be removed because it's monochromatic. So the coupling will just run for sort of until everything is colored. Um, this, such kind of uh, bad colorings do exist. Um, yeah, that's what I said. So, but, so what, essentially what we prove is two things. First, the fraction of this bad coloring is small. So basically that can only happen when all the early verses are monochromatic. So if you color sufficiently large fraction of early verses, you will not in, be in, to, in this situation. And the, then the second thing is for every good coloring, uh, the tracking error is small. This is due to the third constraint. <coughs> um, yeah, so this is, uh, um, again, what I said. So bad coloring must fail many hyperedges during the coupling step. Um, and we couple some kind of K2 uh, vertices for every, for every hyper edge. So of course, it was small if K2 is large. And the error comes from the, uh, this local uniformity. Is con <coughs> so K2 is the number of vertices we color in each hyper edge. So local uniformity is controlled by the empty vertices, which is K, K prime minus K2. And when K prime minus K2 is large, then we know the verses are close to uniform. So somehow we need to balance these two effects. So essentially, we, we, yeah, in the end, we set up an optimization uh, to get the best constant. But it turns out that k2 is just half of k prime. Um, yeah, so that's we, how we get our constants. And uh, yeah, this finishes the uh, whole, <coughs> sorry, this finishes computing the marginal probabilities. And um, OK, this is not quite the end. We, I have shown you sort of uh, how to compute, uh, uh, how to do approximate counting by reducing to con uh, computing marginal probabilities. Uh, this is basically what I said. I will find a good partial coloring. I will compute the marginal probability of that. Uh, for sampling, we need to do something slightly different. We will use the marginal to color versus, but we will do something similar to the coupling process. We color uh, some fraction of verses for every hyper edge. And uh, we show that with high probability, if you color this many verses, then all the remaining connected components have logarithmic size. So it's sort of isolated uh, connected components. And for each uh, component, you just uh, brute force color it it's because it's log size. It's just uh, polynomial time in the end. Okay. Right, and uh, the, the, all these algorithms are. Uh, deterministic. You solve a linear program is deterministic. Well, when you find this partial coloring, you need to use the algorithmic version of local lemma. Uh, it has uh, some de-randomized version we can use. Uh, of course, sampling cannot be deterministic. Okay. So I think that's all about the algorithms. And uh, here are some concluding remarks. Um, the first question that's in my mind is, what's the right threshold? Okay. So my personal guess is something like delta to the 2 over k. Um, but basically, currently, we are still very far away from this. Uh, for coloring in graphs, uh, we know it's uh, roughly delta, but uh, we don't know what's the best constant. For hypergraphs, we don't even know what's the correct order. Okay, and my guess is this. This is because um, the reason I guess this is because uh, for hypergraph independent set, Something like this. Basically, the square of the Lovash local lambda bound is the correct answer. 
However, I don't really have any evidence for that because I don't even know a good uh, NP-harness proof for sampling hypergraph colorings. Okay? You can prove some hardness, but it will be nowhere near this sort of a threshold. At least I don't know how to prove, uh, let's say, delta to the 1 over k kind of threshold. And uh, the rest is sort of a duo of two questions. So first is, can we use this method for normal graph colorings? Um, currently, we have this uh, constant times delta uh, result. And uh, if you use this method just uh, naively, you get some polynomial in delta. So that's not good. Um, but maybe you can optimize it somewhat um, to get better, so at least competing bound for um, competing against like correlation decay or, or zeros of polynomials. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, can we do something about the zeros of hypergraph colorings? This is also something I don't know. Uh, correlation decay seems to be hopeless because recursion is really complicated. I don't know how to deal with that. But uh, maybe zeros is more hopeful. That's just some remarks, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Questions or remarks? Answers? Answers, yeah. Concerns? <laughs> or suggestions? Yeah. Do you know if there's been any results for your final questions in the simple hypergraph case? Is that just ah. Actually, that's a good question. I, I haven't uh, thought about that. Um, Single linear? Yes. Single yes, exactly. Because you, you might expect some of the graph methods to carry over in that. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, my suspicion for simple, uh, you don't get this threshold. You should get delta to 1 over k minus 1. So basically, the phrase uh, at all result. But without the you know login bond. Yeah, actually, I haven't thought about that. Other questions? <coughs> so if not, let us thank the speaker again. And we reconvene at um, eleven forty five.